Thanet. Ryan Shorthouse is director of the centre-right think tank Bright Blue and a former Conservative policy advisor. Dorothy Byrne is former editor-at-large at Channel 4 News and current president of Murray Edwards College, Cambridge. And Yasmin Alibi brown the journalist, author and political commentator. The number to call if you'd like to put a question to the panel, 0345 6060 973. And don't forget, you can watch us on Global Player as well. Can't say fairer than that. Call 0345 6060 973. Tweet at LBC. Text 84850. Cross question with Ian Dale. This is LBC. Well, welcome to you all. Um, sorry that you're remote again. Uh, we will be having guests back in the studio, I think, in a couple of weeks' time, but uh, we shall make the best of it. Uh, our first question comes from Nick in Holland Park. Nick, what would you like to ask? Hi. Oh, hi, Ian. As usual, the answer's implied in the question, but do the panel think that £5 billion a year is good value for a public broadcaster when the government can tweet for free? Dorothy Byrne, I have to come to you first. Um, you spent many years working at Channel 4 News, um, which is also a public broadcaster, we, sh we should say as well. Um, what, what do you think about this row that's broken out today with Nadine Doris announcing a, uh, cash, uh, a cash deal for the BBC, which doesn't include a rise for inflation and guaranteeing the licence fee for only six years? Well, I would say, in answer to your question, I'm not sure that a tweet from the government is worth anything at all, frankly. But I do notice that at the weekend, Nadine Doris tweeted, this will be the last BBC licence fee agreement. And I really think that that is not the way to go about determining the future of one of our most important organisations, if we need to get rid of the licence fee, we shouldn't do so. And maybe we do. If Maybe there's something better, but we shouldn't get rid of it before we know we've got something better. And it, I think £5 billion may be too much. It may not be enough. We should definitely be sure that we get value for money. But we shouldn't mix all these things up. We've also seen the government attacking the BBC over due impartiality. And I think this whole issue of the BBC and impartiality and getting rid of the licence fee is just designed to attract, distract us all from the rows and the problems that they're in. Do you think it is now incumbent on the BBC to tell us how they think they should be funded in the future? Because so far, they've come up with no proposals at all, just relied on the licence fee. And yet, given the advent of subscription TV with not just Sky, but Netflix, Amazon Prime, etc., etc., there are plenty more out there now. We've all got used to paying for our media in that way. Shouldn't the BBC be on the front foot now? Well, I think it is a good idea for the BBC to start looking. Well, I'm sure it has been looking for a long time. Everybody has been looking for a long time for something that is better than the licence fee, but it's been going for nearly 100 years and they've not yet found it. I don't think it's just for the BBC to look. I think Parliament, I think everybody should be looking. But until we know that we've got it, don't get rid of what we've got. I feel in Britain, we are all too often undermining great things that we've got and not appreciating them until we lose them. Craig McKinley, what do you think of the timing of this today? It's, it's a bit obvious, isn't it? It is a, I don't know about a, a, a red meat or big dog strategy. It's a dead cat strategy, isn't it? To di dis distract from the Prime Minister's problems. Oh, I, I think a BBC debate has been brewing for a very, very long time. I'm not entirely sure about I mean, we could say about anything that's announced any time it's there as a distraction from something else. But I'm sure we'll be talking about the Prime Minister's difficulties later during the show. I'm sure I'll, we will. I'll, I'll give you my my take on the BBC. I mean, I, I have those, you know, soft and warm feelings for the BBC. We've been brought up on it. It's, it's like warm porridge. It's something that we've, you know, we know and love. Um, but... 
Uh, and warm think porridge is disgusting, I'm afraid. But uh... well, okay. But uh, I think you put your finger on it to, to some extent, Ian. Is that you know in this modern world we have a choice what we pay for. If we like what we we get, we got a choice, and we'll have more of it. You know, just like we've seen the rise of, as you say, the Netflix and uh, and all of those uh, online services. To think that. You, know, you are forced by law, uh, on pain of a court hearing, on pain of bailiffs, to actually pay this fee for something that you may not use, is slightly anachronistic. It has a sort of a hark back to some different era. But I do love the BBC. I mean, I, I must say, despite all the choice out there, in terms of the radio channels I tend to listen to, uh, you know, BBC Radio Kent, for instance, in my region, uh, is, is one that it tends to be on in the background in my car. And out of all the channels... Well, not LBC. Not LBC. I can't get it that Honestly. well for whatever reason, because I do drive a bit of an older car. Um, but in terms of the news that I tend to watch, yeah, I think BBC probably gets 50% of that, that viewing, actually. So we've all got those feelings for the BBC. But is it now a little bit out of date? Uh, obviously, in the background to all this, I'm sure many will allude to, are we convinced that it is offering cross uh, impartial type of programming. I mean, I've got my concerns about that at times, but that's in its own hands to convince me and others that it is properly even-handed. But there is another problem with the formula that, uh, upon which it's funded. Uh, you've got some very big names, the big celebrities earning some very big money. That doesn't always fit well in what you call public paid for broadcasting. But the reality is, I don't think the BBC would be able to compete in a truly open field. I mean, you see some of these salaries are in excess of a million. And I think when you compare that to, uh, you know, the elderly, the, the, the poor are paid who are having to pay this fee, you know, on pain of a court case, I think the just the basis upon which this is funded, I'm not sure can continue uh, forevermore. But, you know, as I say, I, I, I like the BBC. It is a source that I refer to. I have days where I go, oh, my heavens, that isn't very even handed. Look at that panel. It's not sort of a cross party type panel. We've all seen it. But let me give it one credit that during the Brexit referendum, I will say that it was pretty even-handed, and I was impressed with that. But there are times when I am not. But, I, yeah, it's a debate. It's a debate. We've got five, six okay. years to have that debate now. Well, let's go to one of the highly paid celebrities who often appears on the BBC, Yasmin Alibi-Brown. Yasmin, <laughs> uh, what... <laughs> I wish, I wish. I wish. 43, um, pence, 43 pence a day. 43 pence a day. That's what, that's what, that's what the licence fee costs. Hmm? That's what the pay. license fee costs. Yeah. Sorry? So, what 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 do you I think the government should be doing about it? Things, please. We are, one of the things that we have to remember. This was Nadine Doris tweeting using <laughs> Twitter for a serious policy um, debate that Craig quite rightly says we need to have. What kind of uh, kind of govern governorship is that? How do you behave like that when you tweet? And you're doing it to panic the BBC. You're doing it, as Dorothy said, to distract attention. And my, I mean, it's been quite interesting looking at Twitter to see how many people have come out in support. And, you know, like Craig, there have been times and I've spat at the TV watching the right-wing bias of, of the BBC. Never forget, something like seven to eight BBC editors have walked out and into working for the Tories. For Theresa May, for David Cameron, for Boris Johnson when he was mayor. The idea that this is a lefty thing, and I also remember how Alistair Campbell used to go, you know, attack them like an attack dog. And that tells me that the BBC is doing something quite right. Um, and this is just a mean, vindictive uh, a diversionary thing that this woman whom I cannot bear has thrown out. <laughs> Does your feeling towards Nadine Doris have any relevance to this debate? Sorry? Not very assistant, not no, very no, assistant, is it? Just saying. Okay. Uh, may I say well, that? Oh, go, sorry, go Nadine on, go on, Doris 
has already shown that she's not quite got a grip on her brief. Because if you remember when she was questioned in Parliament about the future of Channel 4, which faces privatisation, she actually thought that Channel 4 was funded by public funds. So I think before Nadine Doris is allowed to make any big decision, she we should just check she actually has a basic grasp of even what the licence fee is. Ryan Shorthouse. Can I just pitch no in judge- there again, Ian? Just no, 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 Craig, Craig, let's okay. hear from Ryan first. I'll, I'll come back to you in a second. Um, Ryan Shorthouse, there's little doubt that Nadine Doris has shaken things up in all sorts of different ways since she's become Culture Sec- <coughs> Secretary. She's been accused of effectively conducting culture wars. Um, what, what do you make of this announcement today? Well, there's a licence fee settlement now for six years um, and who knows whether Nadine Doris will be in post for six years. In fact, who knows whether this government will still be in position um, in the next six years. So there's obviously still all to play for. Six I think weeks. It's right. uh, I think it's right to freeze the licence fee for two years considering the cost of living crisis and um, the sort of rising rate of inflation. After that first two years, you go to a four-year uh, uh, license fee settlement, which does rise I- with inflation. I think more broadly, Conservatives should always be very mindful of the fact when they're cha- re- re- trying to reform institutions, why are they doing it? What is the problem? Uh, and they need to think that that through very carefully before making very drastic changes as they're proposing. I, I mean, in terms of what's wrong with the BBC, I hear a lot of people from the Corbynite left say it's too right wing and a lot of people maybe um, on the right who think it's too left wing. So maybe that cancels it all out and it's doing something right. And of course, when people do criticise the BBC for being politically biased, remember, it's not just a faceless bureaucracy. It's full of hardworking professionals, hardworking journalists, who take their job very seriously. So when we're criticising the BBC for bias, we're criticising individual journalists who take their job, I know, very, very seriously. Um, so there's this accusations of being intensely political. Um, but, you know, apart from these intensely political people, I think the BBC is very popular. The funding model is very popular. And from the evidence I've seen, it adds real value to the economy. There has been studies which have been commissioned by the BBC, admittedly, which suggest that the current model is superior to other funding models in terms of value for money. Um, But You know, um, I think there is an argument about overreach in terms of the BBC, um, in terms of its programmes. And John Whittingdale, the former culture minister, has talked about if you don't have a licence fee model, maybe you go to the core services being taxpayer grant funded and then above that having a subscription model. I think, you know, it's perfectly fine to look at uh, possible solutions like that. But as I say, I I think at the moment, the current model is quite popular. It proves to have good uh, value for money. Uh, And in fact, if you look at other countries with this sort of funding model, actually, the UK is lower than uh, than other countries that have this sort of licence fee model. So I think Conservatives just need to be very careful about the reforms that they're proposing to the BBC, considering its popularity away from intensely political people. Craig, you wanted to come in. I, I, I did. You asked about you know, the timing of this. Is it being used to deflect from other issues, shall we say? Uh, if you're trying to get, uh, or the government trying to get a decent crack of the whip on the BBC, it seems a very strange thing to do at this current time. If, you, if you're trying to get a, a few uh, uh, fair voices uh, fighting one side of the argument. But I think we do forget with the BBC, it's, it's global soft power reach. For many around the world, it does offer, um, you know, unbiased reporting that may not otherwise be seen in some parts of the world and at difficult and troubled times. Uh, So on that basis, I'm I'm very supportive of of, of those aspects of what it does. So would you criticise Nadine Doris for effectively, since she's been Secretary of State, really consistently trying to destabilise the BBC? Because you're right, it is admired the world over. Uh, I don't know quite what is uh, behind what she thinks. And I, I think the debate has to be had because, it, it, as we've said, it is a slightly odd funding formula because you have no choice in it. And that in itself, in the modern world, you know, if you, if you want to buy a Domino's pizza, you'll have a Domino's pizza. If you want to buy, you know, a Ford car, you'll buy a Ford car. But you don't have a choice 
uh, whether you want to uh, pay for the BBC. That is just denied okay. to you. But that in itself, uh, the trouble is it needs a core of funds to do all those things that we do like of it. And without that guaranteed core, w we could lose it. So you know, I'm happy to have the debate. I'm not sold on one side or the other at the moment. OK, thank you very much indeed all for your answers on that question. We have quite a deep and meaningful question coming up, believe it or not, about Boris Johnson. It's 17 minutes past eight. With Ian Dale on LBC. Call 0345 6060 973. 20 past eight. Sally in North London has texted, I stopped watching EastEnders about four years ago and that was pretty much the only thing I would watch on the BBC. I sucked up the cost of it because my daughter used to watch CBBC but she's grown out of that now. I get my news from LBC which is great and free. I get my entertainment from Netflix and Amazon which are both cheaper a month than what I pay the BBC per month. So what am I paying them for? Is that right? I'm not sure that is right whether the BBC per month is cheaper than Netflix and Amazon. Well it certainly isn't together anyway. Right let's move on to another question for our panel. It's from David in Enfield. Hello David. Good evening panel. My question is the five most important principles of public life are leadership, integrity, honesty, openness and accountability. Does the panel think the Johnson government has followed these during the past two years? Yasmin. No. Absolutely not. These are the Nolan principles. Actually, there are a few more than that. I just was listing them the other day. And, and these came in relatively recently in our political history as a result of some terrible scandals, the expenses scandals, you know, some of the things that happened that shouldn't happen in what is still actually until very recently admired the world over as a mature stable and relatively honest democracy so none of them i was thinking has, has have any of them been followed by our prime minister and some of his closest nearest and dearest politically nearest and dearest and the answer is no and i think you know not only is that shocking and bad for them it's a real real disaster for the nation because when you lose the foundations, you know, I've, I've been in countries in the last sort of before COVID where there were, you know, where the countries fought to be liberated from Britain. And in at least three or four of them, including Uganda, where I come from, people would say to me, but you know what? They are honest. They, they're not corrupt like our politicians. And it's like as it, the whole of history has been turned that they look up to this country and look what the country is becoming. And we should all, whatever political color we're, we're uh, you know, we paint ourselves in, we should really care that those fundamental principles are just being thrown away as if they're Primark Mark clothes. Forgive me, Primark. <laughs> Um, Ryan Shorthouse, um, you, you're on the centre right. You, you, you would want to answer uh, yes to these uh, th th this question. Do the panel think Boris Johnson has these uh, important principles of public life? But can you hand on heart do so? Well, we've just criticised Nadine Doris, haven't we, for um, announcing a policy on Twitter. And all the news I've heard about the breaking of rules, etc., have come through Twitter or the news. So I think it's wait to I think it's right to wait for this inquiry that Sue Gray. And by the way, all of my friends are saying, who is Sue Gray? Because she's always in the news at the moment. But, you know, she's a she's wonderful woman. That's all people need to know. <laughs> exactly. But if it's found that Boris Johnson has obviously and consistently broken the rules that he set then yes i think he should resign uh if he's broken them in spirit or to the letter of the rules i, I do think he should resign because it's it's important that the principles are followed and it's just i think a, a matter of reciprocity that if you set the rules you should follow them uh, and if there's kind of one mistake that's been made i mean i saw in the papers for example this weekend carrie johnson was at a social gathering and she did a photo next to a friend if it's one mistake that people make 
fight. But if it's done consistently, uh, and that is found from this report that Sue Gray is doing, then I think it is the honourable thing for, for the Prime Minister to do, to resign. Of course, the question is, will he? Uh, and if he doesn't, which I doubt very much he will, considering um, uh, his previous behaviour, then it's really up to the Conservative Party and the Cabinet in particular to make the decision about whether he goes or not. And at the moment, they all seem to be uh, very much behind him. Maybe Rishi Sunak is slightly lukewarm, but until some prominent figure moves against the Prime Minister, I don't think he'll resign. Ian, can I Craig just come back just for a second Go to on. Ryan? I don't think it is just this scandal. It's the kind of people he stuffed the Lords with. It's absolutely evidenced um, cronyism. It's where the contracts were sent to. So this, 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 what's happening now is a small, and it's not just Boris Johnson. It's I not just Boris Johnson. I don't think the House of Lords appointments are necessarily any different to what previous prime ministers have done around appointments, to be honest. So I don't agree with um, you on that particular issue. Craig McKinley, um, I've been getting calls from uh, Conservatives this evening who are saying, well, we can't put up with this any longer. Steve Baker reckons that in his constituency it's 60 to 1 against Boris Johnson. Um, what's it like where you are in South Thanet? What, what's been the reaction from your constituents? And then we'll come on to the question. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I've received a huge number of emails over the last uh, few days. Uh, I think I finished my about the 250th letter today uh, outlining my position on it. So, yes, it's caused a lot of upset. Uh, I think it's probably only about half the number I had over the Barnard Castle incident last year. Uh, but you, a lot of them, I, you know, I must say, and I must tell you in all honesty, are cut and paste from some campaign organisation that people have filled in. But, yes, there is anger out there. And that anger is because whilst the rest of us and, you know, you and I and everybody probably on this call were doing the right thing, whether we like the rules or not. I thought a lot of the rules were rather ridiculous, but uh, they were the law of the land, went through Parliament, I voted against them, but, you know, so be it. And that's what is, is rankling people and annoying people, that they did all the right things because they were told to do so. We had laws that were backed up, or rules that were backed up with the force of law, and it seems in Downing Street they weren't complying with them. I mean, if you're being charitable, and, you know, frankly, I'm not feeling that charitable on this, Ian, uh, they were all working together in a work bubble of sorts. So in terms of, you know, risk and all the rest of it, it probably wasn't there. But the optics of this, how anybody within any HR department that is in operation in Downing Street could have thought any of this was a good idea is beyond me. Just think about a big corporate with a similar number of people, 300 people working in an office. They would never have thought this was a good idea to have a, you know, a, a, a do in the garden, uh, no matter whether it was safe or not, when, you know, what would this look like in terms of the reputation and integrity of an institution? But, if, you know, uh, what David's point were the, you know, the Nolan principles. And, you know, what I know Yasmin is annoyed about this. We're all annoyed. Uh, but I think uh, the difference between, you know, the UK even where it is at the moment, and many regimes around the world, you, you, you noted Uganda, I think it's quite a different place. I really do. And I know it's um, easy you, you, to call for the head of a prime you, minister, but that is that puts into a train of events that are truly chaotic. And uh, I think we need to look at that very carefully. I mean, you are sounding quite annoyed and, and upset about all of this. Uh, are you considering putting in a letter? Have you put in a letter? I haven't put in a letter, no. No, and uh, at the present time on this no i'm not likely to be putting in a letter well, would you That's would you be clear. provoked to be if dominic cummings allegations that the prime minister did know about well not he went he went to the party so he clearly knew about it on may the 20th not only knew about it but had actually given his approval for it which is what the dominic cummings allegation is beth rigby tonight has got two sources in downing street that that, that appear to confirm what dominic cummings has said that would be incredibly serious wouldn't it if he'd come to parliament last week and given his version of events but hadn't mentioned that that is effectively not telling the truth to parliament well we'll have to you know examine the words that he said and then the words that others if if, if and when they're proved by sue gray so there's a long way to go on this but and i i have likened this a little ian to you go to a restaurant you go a dozen times and it's been great and the one time that it's very poor, that's the one you remember. That's the one you're annoyed about. That's the one that you go on uh, you know, Twitter and everything else saying how dreadful it is. There are mistakes made. 
And I think he's made an admission of those mistakes. And the apology made last week, I think, was a fairly fulsome one. OK, but Dorothy Where Byrne. do we go from there? Is that I, enough? I, I to, to cannot believe that you found that a fulsome apology. I mean, as as a woman, I'm so used to the idea that if a man does something wrong, he says to you, I'm so sorry that you're upset. I'm so sorry that, it, uh, you know, he doesn't say he's sorry. He says he's sorry that he's upset you. And that's the sort of apology this is. I, I mean, one of the things at the time of lockdown that struck me was we were being told to obey this government but I kept noticing that they all kept getting COVID. I mean, it seemed to run rampant through the Department of Health, rampant through Downing Street. Not and as often as Keir Starmer gets it. Well, <laughs> but I, I'm concentrating here on the government. My friends in Archway weren't all getting it at this level. And of course, now we know that they were all breaking all the rules. But the most important point about your questioners um, issue that they're raising is that this doesn't just uh, Boris Johnson's lies undermine our belief in Boris Johnson or even in the Conservative Party. It undermines people's trust in democracy itself. There are really frightening statistics in America about how few young people really believe in democracy. And we do not want to become like the United States of America, where people lose their their fundamental belief that democracy works. And we need to have honest politicians and we need to call them out because that is the only way in which we can keep our democracy safe. Back in August 2019, I was condemned in the mail and the sun in um, editorials for saying, what do we do when a known liar becomes prime minister? And, and, and now they're all saying he's a known liar as far as I can make out. And, you know, the reason that journalists, like journalists at the BBC, like Nick Robinson, who have been criticised for doing this, need to keep calling out um, the lies is to preserve our democracy and I think it's a great shame that it's taken all this time for right-wing newspapers to finally come out and criticise Boris Johnson for what all of us have known. Of course he isn't honest and open and doesn't have integrity. Everybody knows that. Well, um, I, I will plead guilty to a bit of that because I used to pick up callers or Labour politicians when on air they would call Boris Johnson a liar. Um, I've stopped doing that now because the evidence, I think, is, is, I'm afraid, far too overwhelming. And if you want to hear more of Dorothy's views on that, you can uh, hear her interview with me on the LBC Book Club podcast where she talks about her book, whose title is Dorothy. Trust me, I'm not a politician, but I could add to it now... Trust me, I'm not a politician and I'm not called Boris Johnson and I've never had COVID. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's a hostage to fortune, isn't it? We'll come back to our panel in just a moment. It's 8.33 on LBC. Time for the news headlines with Andy Ivey. Cross Question with Ian Dale on LBC. 8.37, let me reintroduce my panel. Yasmin Alab Alibi-Brown is journalist, author and political commentator. Dorothy Byrne is former editor-at-large at Channel 4 News and current president of Murray Edwards College, Cambridge. Ryan Shorthouse is director of the centre-right supporting think tank Bright Blue. And Craig McKinley is Conservative MP for South Thanet. Uh, Claire in Edgware is on the line. Claire, very good evening. What's your question, please? Good evening, Alan and Stella panel tonight. Alan? My Who's goodness. Alan? Who's Alan? Who's Alan? Ian. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not offended. I've only been here 12 years. <laughs> Is the panel pleased about Jeremy Corbyn starting a new political party, presumably another socialist party, and possibly splitting the socialist vote, and the Labour Party being found not guilty of institutional anti-Semitism by the Equalities and Human Rights Commission after a two-year investigation? 
I don't think Jeremy Corbyn's confirmed that he's starting his own party, but let's let's answer the question on the assumption that he is. Um, Craig McKinley, does this make you quake in your boots in South Thanet? Um, no, not really, no. Uh, I mean, it's funny, isn't it? The, the difference we've got today is that I was fully supportive of Jeremy Corbyn. I thought he was the best asset in uh, in politics for the Conservative Party, and he is the reason, uh, as well as uh, the Brexit battles that we were fighting at the time, uh, that we ended up with that very, very uh, strong majority and the, the Red Wall wins. But uh, will he go off on his own? He, he probably spiritually should. Uh, but, uh, you know, let's not forget uh, that uh, the current leader of the Labour Party was fully supportive of him while Jeremy Corbyn was a leader and was... Uh, willing to advance his agenda and advance the 2019 election. Will he do it? I don't know, but he's not fully part of the Labour Party at the moment, so I suppose he, he he's almost halfway there. But does this split votes? Well, you know, we know what smaller parties, they, they tend to have a tough time of it, but do they peel off a few percent? Yes, that's that's possible. And uh, will that be good or bad for the Conservative Party or will he or will he not do it? I don't know. But uh, Jeremy Corbyn is a, an interesting politician, shall we say. But it's funny, isn't it? The, you know, the anti-Semitism, the, you know, the Barry Gardner bits and pieces last week, you know, all of that just floats over the head of everybody while we enjoy the manna from heaven that is the, you know, the Boris Johnson predicament at the moment. But we seem to forget the, all of these things. And, and I do say, you know, are we all without sin? Are we all living in uh, glass houses with double glazing and a bit of chicken wire on top? Perhaps we, we should, because I think none of us are without sin. And uh, on these things, we're human. And well, unfortunately, feel free to tell us about your own sins if you wish. I mean, we're, well, we're here no, to help. There are, there are probably a few, but I, you know, I'm pretty sure there weren't any during this COVID period. But you know, maybe there were. Maybe I did sort of walk okay. on the track of the pavement that somebody All wants right. to pick up. But, but there we are. Um, Dorothy Byrne, they say that if you don't learn the lessons of history, you're condemned to repeat it. Well, the lesson from history is that if the left splinter, the Conservatives stay in power. Do you think that's occurred to Jeremy Corbyn? Well, I am actually a constituent of Jeremy Corbyn. Are you? It's not splitting my vote because he lost it some time ago. Yeah. I feel that Jeremy Corbyn is as much a loss to politics as his brother is a loss to medicine. <laughs> <laughs> is that all you have to say? <laughs> well, I'm afraid it's... the Tories are not going to win in Archway because the idea that Boris Johnson could lead a party that would win over people living on the Holloway Road is that's never going to happen. OK. Ryan? Yeah, I mean, I think Keir Starmer will be very pleased with Corbyn distancing himself from the mainstream Labour Party. I, I think he'd probably see that as an as an advantage. I mean, the, the evidence I've seen from the last election is, yes, Boris cut through with the get Brexit done slogan. But actually, what happened was a loss of support from traditional Labour voters and Jeremy Corbyn really putting them off. So I think Jeremy distancing himself from the Labour Party, mainstream Labour Party, is probably something that Keir Starmer sees as an asset. On, on the point of anti-Semitism, I think this is an interesting thing um, and, and the clearance that's been given. I, I've never personally thought that Jeremy Corbyn is anti-Semitic, um, but I do think there's an issue on the left, which is its view of the world, which is very sort of anti-imperialist, indulges sort of intersectionist politics breaks it's a kind of communalist view, view of the world there's different groups powerful groups weak groups um and you know i think a lot of people on the left see jewish people in this very powerful group and therefore that stems into the anti-semitism uh, that sometimes can happen uh, and this is i think a blind it's not a lot of people on the left i think it's some people on the left and yeah, no, I, I agree. With that. I'm saying you know, my I... left wing friends have campaigned throughout their lives against anti Semitism. So I, I, I don't think we should leave people with the impression that a lot of left wing people. No, I'm are... not. I'm not saying that. I agree. I agree with you on that. But I do think it is a weakness, um, and it's a, it's a weak spot for some people on the left and there is lots of evidence that there are there were people on the left well, uh, in the to, to, to be fair that there, there's evidence of anti-semitism on the hard left and the hard right if you look back in i mean i'm, I'm reading chips channon's diaries at the moment where you don't have to go too far into those to find lots of examples of anti-semitism um yasmin 
Yeah, I have never, I've never been, uh, I, I don't like turning people into witches. I don't even care for what's happening to Boris Johnson at the moment, because his enablers and his supporters who put him into the place he's in are equally responsible. Now, with Jeremy, Jeremy's not an anti-Semite, as Ryan said. I do not believe he's an evil man. He was a hopeless leader. And what I think he could do and he should do is not set up another party, but maybe stand, stand as an independent in Dorothy's constituency and test the waters. But I do find it un, unpleasant when these things are said about the left, because what is meshed in there is, as a left-wing person, I am incredibly concerned about how, the, how Palestinians are being treated by the Israeli state. Somehow, in the last two years, that has been included in a definition of anti-Semitism. I agree with Ryan that there is a kind of belief of Jewish power and wealth, which both right-wing and left-wing people hold. But I think what has happened has been very wrong, that those who criticize Israel's policies towards Palestinians are also, I, I am branded an anti-Semite, because I believe oh. And we're going slightly right. off. And we're going slightly off the question, Yasmin, if you good. don't mind. What well, What about the prospect of him starting his own party? That's what the well, question that would be was. Stupid, even more stupid than standing as leader. Well, he is quite <laughs> stupid, so he might do it. But he's a he's a gentle soul in some ways too. Right. Well, not a lot of enthusiasm for a Corbyn party here, Claire. Um, you, you're clearly an enthusiast. Well, I, I, uh, may I just say, I am a huge admirer of Yasmin. I read everything she writes avidly. As a black woman, she's one of, our, one of my heroines. She's my friend's heroines. We absolutely adore her. And may, may she go on forever. But with regard to Jeremy Corbyn, he's better off standing as an independent. I want him to be brought back into the Labour Party and to have the whip returned because it should not have been withdrawn. And I've never heard anybody on um, LBC or anywhere say to the Labour Party after a really tortuous investigation where they were slammed and vilified, congratulations on being found not guilty of institutional anti-Semitism. Everybody just said, oh, well, okay. You know, I just, I'm, I'm astonished that nobody said well done after withstanding such a horrendous were, were, investigation. I mean, were they cleared completely? Institutional, yeah. They were found okay. guilty of three um, illegal acts, but they, they weren't found guilty of institutional okay. anti-Semitism. Claire, can thank I, you very much. Can in, I just say, can I, Ian, sorry. Go on, Yasmin. I agree with you totally that he should be readmitted into the Labour Party, but Keir Starmer isn't going to let him do that. And so I think he should stand as an independent. OK, right, we'll move on in just a second. It's 8.46. LBC, Nick Ferrari at breakfast. Weekday mornings from 7. The first call Keir of the year, Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer. Daily Mail, Starmer must say sorry for drinks in lock. With Ian Dale on LBC. It's 10 to 9. Craig McKinley, Ryan Shorthouse, Dorothy Byrne and Yasmin Alibi-Brown answering your questions. Here's a text question from Bernadine in Nottingham. A former aide has claimed today that Downing Street could start boozing at lunch and wake up in the same clothes after crashing on sofas as part of long-standing drinking culture. We've all done that. Come on haven't we? Every weekend city centres are filled with drunken embarrassments. Does the UK need to have a serious conversation about its relationship with alcohol? We've always had in this country a bit of a um, weird relationship with alcohol, even going back to the sort of 1600s, 1700s, haven't we? Um, have we learned anything, Ryan Shorthouse, and do you think we need to have a proper debate about it? Well, I mean, there are examples, including in Downing Street, which aren't particularly good, but the long-term trends suggest that we're drinking less and there's a sort of rise in teetotalism and that's particularly prominent amongst younger people. Um, so I think on the whole, there has been um, a sort of healthier relationship that's developed with drink, but of course there are um, isolated examples um, which you know, leads to sort of bad outcomes for the individual involved, but also sort of wide antisocial outcomes. Um, I, I think actually there is probably more of an issue around middle-aged people drinking um, and drinking alone often 
um, and uh, and some of the uh, sort of health conditions that arise from that. That is a problem that some doctors say that we should be a lot more mindful of. Um, so, you know, and that's related to loneliness, uh, to changing work uh, patterns and lifestyles. So I think, you know, it's not, I don't think we should just be thinking Britain has a huge job culture and we should be really worried about it. Of course, there are isolated incidents that need to be dealt with. But on the whole, I think there's positive trends around that. Actually, I think we need to be a little bit more mindful of middle-aged drinkers uh, who are often drinking alone and that's associated with quite poor health outcomes. So I think I we need- I think we should be happy that in Downing Street, they were all drinking together. At least they weren't drinking alone. I mean, you are right about young people drinking less. But again, there's a report this week that millions of people are drinking 50 units a week. So I wonder if we should send some young people into Downing Street to give them a bit of help and therapy. My own daughter is a vegan and doesn't drink. And I hope she won't mind if I offer her up to go into Boris Johnson's office and give them a little bit of health and advice. I mean, they're well, I think all part, part, Dorothy, part of the part of the problem is that. The, the, the complaint is that there are too many young people in Downing Street that he hasn't got enough sort of grey hairs giving him advice. So he's blaming youth for the drink culture. Um, I don't quite get that. <laughs> um, Yasmin, Dennis Thatcher once said, um, I do have a drink problem. My drink problem is that I can't get enough of it. Do you think that's that's the, the, the problem that a lot of people in politics have? Because it is, I suppose it's the same in a lot of areas where if you work hard, play hard, that always inevitably involves a lot of drink, doesn't it? I've never understood the drink culture in this country because I came as an immigrant and, and I, I still can't get my head around how people say they can't have a good time unless they've had a drink. Um, that, you know, a suitcase of liquor had to be taken to where, you know, government's operating. And, you know, it's just such a deep... Almost everybody in my family thinks I'm, I'm stupid or loon for having these views about, why do you have to drink so much? I even said it at Christmas and they thought I was truly crazy. But... <clears throat> It's either a laugh, it goes right back, doesn't it? You look at the cartoons of Hogarth from the 18th century. The drink is at the heart of so much of British culture. And actually, Ryan is right that, you know, the young people have become much more clean in their habits and careful about they take care of their bodies and so on. But I fear that the culture is really sodden with drink. And it is the norm. Lots of Muslim people who work in, in various offices often are excluded because they don't think they want to go to a pub at the end of the day. It is such a part of networking. And it disadvantages them that they don't drink. You know, there's all kinds of... So I remain perturbed by this culture. Uh, and that includes my dear husband, by the way. Well, are you calling your husband a... Well, I can't use the word that I want to use, but um, something head. <laughs> no, that he thinks drink is normal. It's fun. It is something you need to have a good time. You need when you're having a bad time. You need when you're tired. You need when you're happy. And I can't understand this. Now, Craig, do you like to have a... Well, I know you like to have a good time, but do you need to take drink to do it? Uh, well, let me tell you this, Ian, I, I'm not going to become uh, a new adherent to the temperance movement any time soon. But I think this does raise some quite interesting questions. I've, I'm not sure the high streets are any worse now than when I were a lad at uh, age 18. I think they're, they're similar, but it is peculiar. My wife is Hungarian and she is always quite shocked about the state of our high streets because you don't see that type of uh, drinking culture uh, on the streets in, in many other European countries. Maybe that is 
a remnant of uh, you know the First World War when we had those early closing time and everyone went absolutely bonkers over the few hours they were allowed to drink, and we haven't quite got over that. I mean, far from when we had the change to the licensing rules under Tony Blair, where we had the you know 24 hours was possible, that was meant to be the new panacea, so we'd all you know sip a, 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 a sort of a long vermouth on the on the veranda and adopt some sort of continental culture. Well, I'm not entirely sure that works. I think the drinking just went on on longer. But, you know, I, I'm not one of those that wants to demonise a nanny state and all the rest of it. That's far, far away from what I want to be. But I think Ryan uh, highlighted some very interesting points that I think the COVID period has caused some problems because you've had a lot of people who are on their own or, or just you know, not allowed out or not gone out. And so they have reached for the bottle and you know at times i must say and when the, you know, the height of the lockdown it was well i'm going to cook this evening oh and oh we might as well open a bottle of wine shall we where as in normal times i wouldn't have done that but i think it was mm. a, a sense of boredom a sense of well it's just a little treat around the corner in this very mundane life that we were living the worry is that's going to be entrenched for a longer period and i well, think as ryan said middle-aged drinking could be a, a serious problem health problems into the future but i'm not a nanny stater you got a, you know, heaven or hell in a handcart. Of I'd your own never have guessed. Okay. Well, it, it's always wine o'clock on this programme. In fact, you need a, you need to have a bottle to get through it sometimes, I suspect. But anyway, um, not tonight, though, with our wonderful panel. Our final text at the end of the programme, it's Julia in Brighton. Keir Starmer says Gary Neville should run to become a Labour MP. I suspect he wants to be Mayor of Manchester. Uh, who else would you like to see come into politics? Sure. Um, Yasmin. Have you ever thought of going into politics? <laughs> Can you imagine me in politics? It'd be entertaining. Oh, God. oh God, I wouldn't inflict that. Who else? Who would I? I quite like Gary Lineker. He's a very thoughtful man. So go on, Gary. Um, uh, well, he can afford to. He can afford to do it. Hmm? You'd rather have Marcus Rashford, um, yeah. Dorothy. He's too young. Okay. He's too young. Oh, yeah, he'd be he'd be great, and he's not an alcoholic. <laughs> Ryan. <laughs> Well, I, I was, I mean, you know, there's a sort of issue with the celebrification of politics generally and lots of celebrities going into it. I mean, I just coming to my mind, somebody, uh, there was, I don't know if you remember the Finsbury Park attack in 2017, the imam there who um, did a wonderful thing in terms of protecting the person who was um, committing the terrorist attack, Mohammed Mahmoud. And I think he was actually, he got an honours uh, eventually, quite rightly. Someone like that would be brilliant in politics. Craig. Well, Ian, it's you, my friend. You should be the one that's in this place. <laughs> and you could be enjoying this fun like we would do on a, on a daily basis. But, uh, no, I would say I, I haven't got one up my sleeve of some, you know, dynamic character I'd like to see in, in Parliament. I would say that the Conservative Party we currently have uh, making up the MPs is pretty broad, is pretty wide. Uh, I like to see people who've done something in their lives personally, who can bring a bit of experience to the role. I think that's very much needed. And just carrying on from, I think it was, whose question was it? David's question. I do think we need some adults in Downing Street and perhaps some wise heads across the whole of the Palace of Westminster. Uh, I, I'm, I'm a bit opposed to the celebrification of the process. Uh, I think we need some wise heads, people with experience, and let's get on with the job properly. Well, I did try, Craig, but the electorate fought back and uh, they're, they're, they've lost, they've had the chance now. But thank, thank you. you very much indeed uh, to you all. Craig McKinley, Yasmin Alibi Brown, Dorothy Byrne and Ryan Shorthouse. We, of course, will be back with Cross Question tomorrow at eight. And if you've missed any previous episodes, you can catch up on Global Player. Coming up in the next hour, we are going to talk about the fact that more than £4 billion of public cash taken from fraudsters from COVID support schemes has been written off by the Treasury. What's your reaction to that? And are you a bit vexed? Maybe if you're a victim of the loan charge um, fines, maybe you think maybe the, the Treasury could be a little bit more lax with you if they're so willing to write off this money. 0345 6060973. It's one minute past nine. On your radio, on Global Player, and Play LBC. Leading Britain's conversation, this is LBC. 
From Global's newsroom, it's claimed the Prime Minister was warned in advance that staff were holding a bring-your-own-booze party at Downing Street despite a national Covid lockdown. Boris Johnson's former aide...